Доброе утро. Меня зовут Дарья, я директор публичной программы Института Стрелка. Очень приятно видеть вас с этим прекрасным пятничным утром. Обычно я задаю вопрос на всех наших мероприятиях, кто у нас в первый раз, а сегодня я хочу задать вопрос, кто был на Стрелке на наших летних мероприятиях. Поднимите руку, пожалуйста. Супер. Тогда я обращаюсь к большинству, которые у нас сегодня впервые, Институт Стрелка, в основном в 2009 году, Институт архитектуры и медиадизайна. Мы образовательное учреждение, у которого есть своя образовательная программа, которая длится год. У нас есть магистрская программа по урбанистике совместно с Высшей школой урбанистики. У нас есть издательская программа, когда мы переводим книги иностранные на русский язык. У нас есть свой онлайн-журнал Стрелка Магазин, школа онлайн предпринимателей, онлайн школа городских предпринимателей Вектор. И вообще все то, чем занимается институт, направлено на улучшение физического и культурного ландшафта российских городов. Институт существует уже более 8 лет, и каждый год здесь во дворе проходит публичная программа. Мы приносим международных экспертов из различных отраслей, графический дизайн, Два года назад наша образовательная программа перенаправилась, скажем так, свое направление в сторону технологий. Сейчас, в последние два года, мы рассматриваем, как же все-таки технологии меняют города, наша с вами привычную жизнь. Уже два года подряд мы сотрудничаем с системой VC в плане организации мероприятий здесь у нас во дворе Стрелка. Для нас сегодня очень такой знаменательный день, потому что весь день здесь будут выступать эксперты. Конференция у нас сегодня международная. Я буду очень близким человеком, который перед вами сегодня говорит на русском языке, потому что все остальные спикеры будут выступать на английском. Я желаю вам хорошего дня, день сегодня будет насыщенный, а сейчас я бы хотела передать слово Александру, генеральному директору Vision Labs, нашего партнера сегодня. Александр, пожалуйста, спасибо большое, хорошего дня. Привет всем. From this moment let's switch to English. On behalf of Vision Labs, we are really happy to welcome all of you here, and um, we are very happy to contribute to community and organize this wonderful event. Before we start, I want to tell why we decided that, why we decided to make this event and why we believe it's so important for us. Uh, computer vision is a rapidly growing field. For the last 10 years, it changes dramatically. 10 years ago, uh, almost nobody knew about uh, computer vision um, except uh, some research labs. And today, our computers know how to search our images. Our cars start to know how to drive us from point to point. And I believe in the nearest future, computers will solve so many another tasks. And personally, I believe that uh, the, the key factor of driving this process is human interaction, is interaction all of us. So that's why we decided to bring top international speakers and um, invite uh, Russian community to exchange ideas and to push the limits uh, of computer vision and deep learning. So today in this program we will have, uh, the first part is uh, uh, Russian researchers. We'll highlight some topics. Then we will have post-poster session during the lunch. And then we will have uh, international speakers uh, with, uh, with top topics. So enjoy your time. And uh, you are welcome once again. Thank you. Ah. 
Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Alexey Katkov. Uh, I am president of System Venture Capital Fund. Um, it's a bit difficult to speak after such a great expert like Alexander. <laughs> so I'll say just a couple welcome words. Uh, uh, so, uh, what I would like to say. Uh, we support uh, many activities which help people to learn more about uh, such cutting edge technologies like machine learning and uh, major trends in science. And uh, machine learning is a hot trend uh, everyone is excited about. And currently, computer vision it's uh, one of the best example uh, of artificial intelligence. And uh, today uh, you will meet the leading scientists and professionals uh, who have made the great impact on development on computer vision. And uh, I'm sure you will learn much more from uh, our prominent speakers. So, uh, enjoy your time. Thank you for coming, and uh, it's a great honor for us to be part of this event. Thank you. Okay, so hello again. So, I am uh, Ivan Laptev. I'm going to chair this uh, morning session uh, on, um, where we'll have four distinguished speakers from uh, academia and industry. Uh, so, and, uh, so the first speaker is going to be Viktor Limpitsky, uh, who is a professor at Skolkov Institute of, Institute of Technology. And uh, so the topic of his uh, lecture is towards realistic neural image synthesis. So. Thank you, Ivan. I will be talking about neural image synthesis, and let me start right away by defining what do I mean by this. Today I will mean it in a very narrow sense. I will be talking about neural networks that are able to look at some distribution of images defined just as a bunch of images, nothing else. And um, those neural networks should be able to learn from this collection and then be able to generate new uh, samples from this distribution. Okay, uh, there are many variances of this problem when we show the network something else, for example, some other distribution, or maybe feature points of, uh, 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 of uh, face features, uh, uh, and then the results would be better, but I will be talking, taking this problem in a very poor form, and then later, in the evening, we'll uh, see the amazing results from uh, uh, Alexei Efra's group um, um, with uh, uh, more nuanced uh, uh, types of this problem. Okay, uh, so mathematically how this works, let me uh, plunge into a bit of uh, abstraction, uh, is that we have some distribution in the image space, so I will denote it with such blue stuff, uh, and we don't uh, have access to this distribution exactly. Uh, um, directly, we just have a bunch of samples from it. And then uh, uh, we have some, introduce some latent space, and we introduce some simple distribution in this latent space. For example, it could be 100 dimensional space, and uh, it could be some simple Gaussian distribution, or maybe some sphere, and some uniform distribution of the sphere. And then our neural network will be just mapping our simple distribution to our complex distribution in the image space. And by mapping the distribution, uh, we get some new distribution, which I will uh, paint as green. And our task is to adjust the parameters of this uh, generator network such that the green distribution matches the blue distribution. Okay, and sometimes we will be successful. For some points uh, in our latent space, they will be mapped in the part where green and blue overlap and then those samples would look nice. Uh, it won't work perfectly, so sometimes uh, some points in latent space will be mapped um, to points which are in the green but not in the blue, and these are samples which look badly. 
And another important type of mistake, which are harder to spot, uh, but and that which is uh, harder to fight, is that there will be some points in the blue space which are real images which will not be covered by the green distribution. Okay. Um, so the, once again, the challenges of aligning of training such a network is that uh, it's a very complex distribution in the image space, and we start with a very simple distribution in the Latin space. So we need to lots of layers, lots of parameters, and uh, solve a hard learning problem. Um, and to train a big architecture to mold our simple distribution into our complex distribution. Uh, the bridge distribution is not given to us directly. We just have very, very sparse samples because our space is very high dimensional, space of images. We have, even if we have a million or a billion images, it's still a very, very sparse representation of what natural images are. Um, and then green distributions are hard to evaluate for some technical and not technical reasons. If we just take arbitrary distribution, plug it into neural network, we won't be able uh, to tell what is the probability of some point in the image space under the green distribution. That's a hard problem. Okay, um, so why do we care about image synthesis? Uh, there could be different reasons. First of all, it's fun, even if uh, those faces look uh, a bit um, uh, scary. Then it's, uh, many people argue that's a hard problem, that's a new frontier in AI. Uh, uh, as our image recognition uh, systems start getting uh, to work better and better, uh, people are turning towards a harder problem, synthesizing images. Um, when it works successful, then uh, these systems can be plugged into image editing systems, into um, computer graphics system, and uh, there they are likely uh, to do a lot of uh, a lot of progress. And um, uh, finally, interestingly, there is like mounting amount of evidence that those modules that can synthesize images are very useful for actual systems that recognize images for. Uh, for many reasons. So even if we only care about computer vision, we still want to be able to generate images. Um, because of this mounting interest, there are lots of um, quite, quite a bit diverse of diversity of approaches who, that do neural image synthesis. Um, maybe the top two uh, uh, are variational autoencoders, generative uh, adversarial networks. Um, uh, there are more. I will be focusing on the second one today exclusively. Uh, I think Dmitry will mention uh, at least a little bit uh, uh, the first. Um, and in more details, so my plan for today would be first to speak generative adversarial networks. Uh, I believe many of you would, uh, would know quite a bit about them already or maybe have played with them. Uh, and uh, then the first part of my talk would be a good time to check your email. Uh, and. Uh, uh, then I will alert when I will move to the second part of, your, of, of the talk, when I will uh, discuss some, um, some new stuff that uh, um, we have done in our group uh, with uh, uh, Dmitry Ulyanov and Andrea Vidal. Okay, so let me start with generative adversarial networks. That's maybe the most exciting, at least one of the most exciting things that happened in uh, machine learning over the last few years. Um, and um, um, genetic adversarial networks consist of two parts, of two, two neural networks, which are adversarial to each other. The main one is the generator, which works just as I described a few slides ago. So it takes a sample from a relatively low dimensional space, some pack point, some vector, say, think about a point on this sphere, and pass it through the network, which uh, has some special architecture. People put a lot of work, a lot of effort in tuning the parameters of this architecture, how this architecture should look like. And those images, uh, those sample get transformed into an image by uh, a large number of carefully tuned uh, uh, simple operations. Okay, um, and interestingly, generator doesn't get to see the blue distribution, the true distribution directly. Uh, Instead of uh, that, there is a discriminator which looks at both at the generator distribution, the green distribution, and the blue distribution, and the task of the discriminator is to tell between real examples, the blue examples, and the fake generated examples, the green, exam the green examples. The goal of discriminator is to, to do the best job at predicting what is the probability that a certain example is green or blue, okay? Um, now, and during training, um, 
discriminator uh, tries to stay up to date because the green distribution is always changing, tries to maintain the best estimate about the ratio of the probabilities, um, and the generator tries to make its job as hard as possible by, by generating better and better samples, which look more and more realistically. In more detail, um, um, the way this, uh, so the discriminator and the generator are updated in turns. When it's turn of the discriminator to get, to get updated, uh, it takes a bunch of uh, examples generated from current dist uh, using current generator. It takes a bunch of uh, real examples and then it updates its parameters to, uh, to estimate, to approximate the ratio so that, for example, the ISO line of 0.5 is a boundary uh, across which uh, there are either more real uh, points are uh, either more likely, likely to be from real distribution or from generated distribution. Okay, so it's effectively uh, we turn the task of aligning uh, two complex distribution in the task into a much simpler task of uh, binary classification. That may be the main trick behind adversarial networks that we take a very hard problem and take it and turn it into the most researched, the most uh, uh, basic uh, uh, machine learning problem, which is binary classification. Okay, and then the gradient of the discriminator, they provide the hint to the generator how the green distribution should be moved to, be, to get a better alignment with the blue one. Okay, so when, we, when it's turned to update the generator, uh, we take an example or a bunch of examples, we pass them through the generator, then we submit it for the evaluation to the discriminator, and discriminator evaluates uh, some value, which is basically how likely does it think in its current state, that this example is actually real, not fake. So we know it's fake, but the discriminator doesn't know. So we look at the probability uh, that the discriminator assigned it to be real, and then we back propagate this value through the network, uh, through, the through the discriminator, then into the generator and through the generator, and we update the parameters of the generator so that um, the image changes slightly. So this image uh, changes slightly and become, becomes more real. That's how training proceeds. And mathematically, it can be expressed in using game theory. Um, so there is this objective, and generator tries to uh, decrease the, the value of this objective. Um, and the discriminator tries to increase the value of this objective. In reality, almost invariably, uh, the situation is more complex. There is like more complex game with two diff slightly different objectives for discriminator and generator, so it's a non-zero sum game. But it's maybe it's uh, it's um, it's not uh, conceptually it's not that important. Okay, um, so here is uh, how typical examples from uh, GANs look these days. So this GAN, this generator, has been trained together with this discriminator on a collection of uh, images of uh, bedrooms, um, and these are how examples look like. And if you sit far enough, they look amazingly realistic, at least. Uh, these examples, like say 10 years ago, would, would, would you know, wow all the researchers in the community, I'm sure. Um, okay, uh, this is like a more state of the art system and um, trained for a more complex distribution, so the distribution of very diverse classes, very diverse images. And these are real examples on the right, on the left you see the, the generated, and again, if you squint or if you don't sit close enough, they look amazingly real. Uh, there is something, um, well, something wrong with them. If you look, like, for example, there are lots of images of some orange stuff uh, uh, in the foreground and black stuff in the background, and it's clear, like, some recurring topic, which is not so common in, um, in the real images, but it happens a lot in the generated images. So there is, like, not enough diversity. And also, if I zoom in into the top left corner, that shows sort of the limitation. Uh, so we see like four animal type creatures and the textures are, are great, right? They have nice fur, they have nice grass in the background, but they have a wrong number of uh, heads, they have a wrong number of eyes. Um, so basically the system gets textures very well, the system doesn't get uh, geometric 3D shape. And uh, that's the next big challenge, and probably this challenge might not be solvable in this framework when we just show the system 2D examples. We need uh, to bring in 3D geometry into training. 
Okay, uh, but coming back to this uh, diversity problem, uh, so the diversity problem is another like big obstacle uh, that many people are working towards solving. Uh, and the reason it uh, emerges is that if we fix uh, the discriminator and the update generator for too long, it, ba it, it turns to collapse to a primitive distribution that then just picks the most real example it can pr uh, generate, the most real from the viewpoint of the current discriminator, and it shrinks all the distribution, tends to shrink all the distribution towards the one single example. So that's an inherent instability, and of course, uh, therefore, nobody runs generator till convergence, it does just a few up update steps, and after that, the discriminator changes, and there is progress towards more diverse distribution, but this collapsing behavior is very hard to fight, and it, sh and it results, in reality, it results in uh, in uh, reduced diversity of the generated samples. Okay, so like these are very nice faces generated by Red Forest et al. system, the DCGAN system, and uh, uh, they look very realistic given that the system has never seen like, uh, doesn't know any information about what faces are apart from a bunch of images. And then if when you start looking at, um, at the results, you start sort of noticing that some people's, some, some people here are like siblings, right? So there's like these two women who maybe are not exactly twins, but they're like maybe sisters. And like here is like another like two brothers. Um, and then maybe if you will start, wow, well, this guy is, is, is pretty unique, um, but well, not very realistic. Um, and uh, if you look further, like there are some modes missed, like there are very few people with um, transparent eyeglasses, although there are quite a lot in trainings in the training set. So the diversity is actually a harder thing to achieve than realism in some sense. Okay, uh, so these are what GANs, modern GANs can do, and these are sort of two biggest problems with them. Uh, now I want to talk about uh, another limitation of them that fortunately we now know how to overcome. Um, and uh, the problem is that GANs, in, in the vanilla form, they are, they are uh, uni, unidirectional. So they can take a point in the latent st space and generate a new image on the sample, okay? But if I take a point in the image space, if I take an image, um, then I don't have a mechanism straight away to find out what is the good latent representation, what is a good uh, point on the sphere that generates this image, okay? So um, ideally we want another maybe neural network that can take, that can uh, provide the reverse mapping, take a point in the um, image space and generate, um, uh, generate uh, uh, its latent representation. Uh, it's present in autoencoders by sort of from the beginning by construction. Uh, it's absent in, neuron, in the set of neural networks and it would be very nice to have it for many reasons. Um, and uh, once again, Alyosha in the evening will show what you can, what amazing stuff you can do when you have this reverse direction. So this is a spoiler slide uh, for his system. Um, when they did like reasonable job of learning this reverse mapping post hoc after the GAN is trained, and then they can do amazing sort of stuff on editing images. But it would be nice to have um, generator and encoder learned at the same time so that as a, as a product of learning, we straight away get the generator and the encoder. Um, and th there are several approaches now to how you can do that. This is conceptually maybe the, um, my favorite. Uh, it says, uh, Okay, let's assume that we have learned the generator and the encoder networks. And let's assume they do perfect job so that a generator perfectly aligns the gray uh, with the blue, right? So it generates perfect alignment between the green and the blue. And the encoder, on the other hand, when it maps the blue distribution back, it gets this nice sphere, okay? Then, if we get this perfect alignment, then the joint distributions of images and the latent codes should be indistinguishable of whether we use the generator to, gener to create this joint pair or the encoder. Okay, this is, by the way, a good time to switch on if you have a checking email through the GAN presentation. Uh, okay, so we, we, we want to ensure that these two distributions are, are, are the same. This is a sufficient condition for our generator and encoder work well. So whether we take uh, a latent example, a latent point and generate an image for it, or whether we take a real image and generate its latent example, we shouldn't be able to tell the difference. 
Okay, and then we can train a discriminator which now takes as an input not only the image but also its Latin code and it tells from which of two classes from which of two classes uh, does this sort of joint pair come. So um, as a result, um, if we are successful then the discriminator should be fooled and uh, now discriminator when it's not fooled it's providing keys it's providing directions how we should update our generator network and our encoder network so that these two distributions get as confused as, as confusing as possible for the discriminator. Okay, and in this way they can learn very nice, well, they, essentially they can learn uh, uh, generators which look, provide as nice examples as GANs and uh, uh, they can train um, also, they can also do the reconstruction, okay, they can take an image plug it into the encoder, find its Latin code, and then generate the image back. And the perfect success would be if we get the same image back. Fortunately, in their system, it doesn't really, it doesn't really um, uh, happen for, for many, in many cases. So for the close-up, the bottom example is a good one, actually. Um, the lady is reconstructed quite well. Uh, but then the top two examples are not really like good. Like, uh, and um, generally, it's hard. So this uh, to component mapping diverges from the identity quite a bit. Okay, and now um, is the last part of the, uh, my um, talk. Let me introduce a new system uh, that we have developed um, for training together the generator and the encoder, and it also uses adversarial training. And um, we worked it with my uh, PG student uh, Dmitry Ulyanov, who is like the main person who did the job, and Andrea Vidalje. And the key feature of this system is that there are only two components, only the generator and only the encoder. Um, and there are no external discriminators, no other, no other networks to be trained, okay? So uh, no more discriminators. Um, okay. Um, and instead we'll get the generator and the encoder to play the adversarial game with each other. Okay, uh, so um, this is the objective for this game, and let me just explain. Uh, and send the, uh, the formula is here just for the, for intimidation. Let me just explain what's going on in this game. Um, so we have some divergence measure, which basically takes a bunch of examples in the latent space, okay, in this space, and compare it with, my, with our prior distribution. Our prior distribution is very simple, remember? It's just a uniform distribution on a sphere or it's, or it's just a Gaussian. So we can have a simple divergence measure which com takes a bunch of examples and say um, whether they come from this, this distribution or not. That's what all mathematical statistics is about. Um, okay, and then uh, the second term uh, measures uh, the divergence between this uh, blue distribution mapped back to the Latin space and the prior distribution. And uh, the first term is measures more complex thing. It takes the Platin's, Latin distribution, maps it, to the, um, maps it to the real image space by the generator and then maps it back uh, to the um, Latin space and it measures the divergence between the prior and um, the obtained distribution if the generator is perfect and the encoder is perfect, then there should be ideal match. And now uh, there are two objectives for the adversarial objective for the generator and the encoder. So the generator tries um, to align the green distribution with the blue distribution as much as possible so that no matter what the encoder does, uh, there is a perfect alignment between the, uh, at least um, with the, between the green and the blue. And, um, the, the encoder tries to first ensure that the blue distribution gets aligned with the gray distribution perfectly and at the same time that the green distribution is not getting aligned with the gray distribution perfectly. So it tries to make life for the generator as hard as possible. Okay, so it tries to spread the blue over the whole gray sphere but it tries to shrink the green uh, towards maybe a point. And the only thing that the generator can uh, fight this, it can ensure that the green distribution spread over the blue distribution as, uh, as, as tightly as possible. Okay? And uh, the nice thing is that it's, it's really simple to evaluate these uh, divergence measures and that they 
um, uh, and that they uh, are computed inherently at the batch level. Okay, so for example, we can take a bunch of uh, samples from the Latin space, uh, from the Latin space, pass them through the generator, get a bunch of images, pass them through the encoder, get a bunch of uh, vectors, fit the Gaussian, and compare this Gaussian with uh, the prior Gaussian. Okay, and that's there is a simple formula for that. Okay, um, so I see, I see Dmitry is nodding, so <laughs> probably he understood. Uh, on top of that, we can add a standard reconstruction loss, which basically says that if we take a point, map it to the um, image space, map it back, we want this divergence to be small. So it's, it's straightforward to add these losses into the training, and we do that. This is like what uh, most, uh, uh, most um, this is what autoencoders do, for those of you who know what autoencoders are. Uh, but interestingly, these terms are not necessary to align the two distributions. So even with the previous slide, we get alignment between the green and blue distribution as we play this game. Okay, so these are, these are some examples for this system, for the face, and they look sort of at the same level as GAN gets. Okay, they're not much worse, they're not much better, but as the main benefit, we get we get this uh, ability to reconstruct. Okay, so here in each column, uh, in each of the halves, uh, so the left column is the input real image. The next column are the reconstructions that we get with our two networks, and it trains quite fast. It trains like a few hours for 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 this data set. The other system I mentioned here. Um, I mentioned uh, uh, before, gets to the similar quality of reconstructions, but after much longer training, and few days of training, because it has to train this discriminator in a complex compound joint space of uh, images and their Latin codes. We don't, we don't, we don't need it. Um, Ali with star is what, we, is, is what happens to Ali. We give a limited time budget of about three times uh, time as much time as we give our system to train and they look much worse than our reconstructions. And in the right, uh, there is like a reconstruction with autoencoders. Maybe it's not easily visible in, the scre in this screen, but on the laptop screen, you, you see it's, they are visibly, they're very blurry, this is the, which is the main sort of Achilles heel of, 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 of autoencoders. Okay, uh, these are some more examples uh, from uh, the image net distribution uh, down sample to a small size. Uh, so the left is real, right are uh, fake, generated. Uh, uh, there's a comparison with Ali, again, so our reconstructions in, this, in, the, in that example, they're quite a bit better, noticeably better. Okay, to conclude, to recap, so I covered the uh, generative adversarial networks, which once again, if you, if, if, if you don't know what it is, uh, and if you don't haven't get it from my talk, uh, you should definitely learn about it. If you're interested in machine learning, that's the most, one of the most interesting things in machine learning over the last few years. Um, uh, and um, uh, recently there is like a bunch of approaches. I presented two of them that can uh, do train joint uh, sampling and inference together. And um, uh, one of them, our approach is uh, attractive for its simplicity and has only two components, no more discriminators. Uh, and there's a last slide, which I will stop at. Uh, so, Scotech, our university is hiring at all levels, including master level. If you're looking for a good master program, now it's a very good time to apply, please do that. Um, and um, thank you for your attention. So, thank you, Victor, very much. We have a, uh, so this has, half an hour presentation, so, but we will have your questions if you, if somebody wants to ask. You can also ask in, our, in Russian, don't be shy. Uh, hi, uh, thanks for the great talk. Uh, I have a question. So the latest, uh, the, the, the last model that you're talking about uh, definitely, uh, uh, you know, overcomes the difficulties of, uh, wow, <laughs> uh, of uh, getting a distribution that is not diverse, but is there something that prevents it from, you know, generating a wrong number of eyes or heads? 
being what? Sorry. Then generating the last just. That prevents the model from generating the wrong number of eyes on heads. No, no, no. It doesn't. It doesn't. It doesn't make a breakthrough in terms of the quality of generated images over GANs. Its main advantage is that it gets you this inference ability. It's still no. The problem of a wrong number of heads, no wrong number of eyes, is still there for the grabs. That's. It's not worse. It's not. It's not, it's, worse, yeah. it's not worse, but it's yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Скажите, пожалуйста, о каких размерах изображений идет речь? Исходное изображение и сгенерированное изображение. Вот в пикселях размерность. Um, so the question was, uh, what is the resolution of images that current GAN systems typically work with? And most experiments are done with small images like 32 by 32, 64 by 64, but the best of the systems get to about 256 by 256, and going beyond uh, without extra tricks is hard. But also very slow. Just, it's also a matter of just how long you are willing to wait. Okay, maybe last question. Насколько я понял, для обучения вам необходимо подавать изображение соответствующему точке пространстве скрытым серым, правильно? Pass the image and its point in the Latin space, right? No. So the question is whether we need aligned samples in the Latin space and in the image space for training. And the answer is no. We just need the samples in the image space. А только в пространстве изображений нам нужен пример изображений, и модель сама выравнивает набор изображений и с латентным, с латентным распределением. Все эти модели это делают. Но ведь, но ведь вот в той схеме, которую вы рисовали, у вас есть обучение вправо и влево. Вы обучаете генератор и энкодер. Вы обучаете генератор и энкодер. Correspondingly, uh, you need to have one point in the left sphere and uh, the other point in the left hand sphere. The left hand sphere. Is that correct? No. Or you get an image from the sun. Yes. 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 Yes.
Mostly I will speak about Bayesian methods and about uh, how they can be combined with the most popular and uh, mainstream approach in machine learning, which is uh, currently deep learning. So the outline of my talk will be as follows. Uh, first, I will briefly describe uh, what is Bayesian framework and how uh, Bayesian framework can be used for solving machine learning problems. Uh, then we'll talk a bit about uh, how to sc scale Bayesian methods, about uh, so-called variational Bayesian inference. And then there'll be a second part, which is a bit more applied, uh, on how we can uh, interpret uh, non underpowered procedure as a special case of Bayesian procedure. And finally, uh, what interesting properties we may obtain if we uh, interpret dropout as a, uh, uh, in terms of Bayesian framework. Uh, so probably the, the conceptual scheme of my talk is uh, illustrated on the following slides, which I do like a lot. Uh, so it states that uh, from Bayesian point of view, uh, almost all existing procedures can be interpreted uh, from Bayesian framework can be interpreted as a special case of Bayesian framework. And uh, from this point of view, uh, any further resistance to uh, Bayesian offensive is uh, useless. So this is a conceptual scheme. And uh, I will try to convince you uh, that it is really reasonable during the remaining part of my talk. Uh, unfortunately, this will be the last picture in my slides. So all other uh, slides will contain lots of equations. Uh, if you do not understand some of them, please don't be afraid, uh, because well, you may always uh, uh, look through the presentation afterwards. And uh, my main aim is to, con um, to give you just some conceptual insight, not to, 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 to provide the understanding of the whole details. So please do not be afraid if you miss some equations. Uh, so let's start from uh, classical Bayesian inference. Uh, so this is uh, alternative framework for uh, probability theory, uh, uh, which provides us a way of uh, estimating unknown variable theta if we observe uh, some observation, some, some data x, which is uh, somehow related to theta. So the idea is pretty simple. Uh, first, we need to encode our ignorance about the unknown value of theta in terms of our distribution, which is called prior distribution. So this is pure theta. Uh, then by usually given a probabilistic model, which shows uh, how x, how our observed data is related to theta. And uh, this is a likelihood function, which oops, uh, shows how probable it is to observe the given data x if unknown value uh, had value theta. And if we are given uh, these two components, uh, we may easily derive, uh, perform so-called Bayesian inference to apply non-Bayes theorem. Uh, which results to so-called posterior distribution. So posterior distribution shows how our ignorance about the values theta has changed after we have observed data. And what is uh, the most important is that uh, this posterior distribution, P of theta given x, contains all information about theta we can extract from data x. So any, any simplifications, for example, uh, any point estimates like maximum likelihood, like uh, MIP estimate, uh, leads to the loss of some relevant information. So if we use uh, exact Bayesian inference, uh, uh, we keep all the information we could extract from uh, data x. And surprisingly, it appears that this is quite a fruitful concept. Uh, it allows us to build extremely complicated probabilistic models uh, from a simple ones uh, uh, using this uh, Bayesian inference. So and now let us uh, see how it uh, can be applied to machine learning. So consider standard machine learning formulation. Uh, we're given training set, which uh, x t x is uh, uh, x as our features. So t is a hidden component, which we would like to predict given x. And we are given some probabilistic uh, classifier, some probabilistic uh, prediction algorithm, which uh, predicts the probability of t uh, of t given x. And this uh, prediction algorithm is parameterized with the weights w. So our traditional approach is uh, to uh, somehow adjust the values W uh, by minimizing uh, training error or by maximizing training likelihood. But from Bayesian point of view, uh, actually, uh, the algorithm is a bit uh, different. Instead of trying to, to find single algorithm, single value of W, uh, we are performing Bayesian inference. And uh, we are at, uh, at the training stage, we are trying to estimate posterior distribution on W. So uh, this is it. So we simply apply a Bayes theorem. 
uh, which states uh, uh, which results into posterior distribution uh, given training data observed. And then at the testing stage, uh, instead of applying single algorithm with single W, uh, actually what we need is to perform weighted voting to perform, uh, to apply the whole ensemble which is given by our posterior distribution. So at a training stage, we are finding ensemble, which is posterior distribution W, and uh, at the test stage, we're applying this ensemble by averaging uh, the predictions given by uh, all algorithms uh, within our ensemble. And the ensemble itself is set by posterior distribution P of W given XT. So this is a conceptual scheme. This is how we should work in theory. But of course, uh, in practice, the situation is uh, more complicated, and the problems arise uh, with these two integrals. Uh, modern machine learning algorithms consist uh, of millions of adjustable parameters, so the dimension of W space uh, is, uh, well, uh, has the order of millions. And in this case, it is extremely difficult to perform these uh, computations. But if we can't perform this integration, we can't uh, we come up with a posterior distribution and we can perform uh, weighted voting at the testing stage. So this was uh, the main limitation of Bayesian methods and uh, until very recently it was uh, widely uh, considered that uh, Bayesian methods are good when we have small data but we can't generalize uh, those ideas to the uh, large scale machine learning problems. But fortunately uh, during the last year situation uh, has changed and the breakthrough uh, is related with the so-called variational Bayesian inference or, uh, or just variational inference. Uh, so what, what is the idea? Instead of trying to uh, find the exact posterior distribution, P of W given XT, uh, we're trying to approximate it with a simple distribution from some parametric family. So this simple distribution is usually called variational approximation, Q of W given phi. So the idea is to minimize some distance measure between uh, the two distributions, between the true posterior distribution and between our uh, variational approximation. And then all we need to do is to find uh, the best values of phi. Uh, so now the question is uh, what distance measure uh, to select? There are different approaches, but the most popular one uh, is related to uh, Kyle divergence. So this can be treated as a some pseudo distance in the space of distributions. So KL is a non-negative function and it equals to zero if and only if two distributions coincide. So uh, we may try to, to solve this optimization problem and to find phi, uh, which will uh, stand for the closest, closest variation approximation in the space of uh, Q distributions and the, the, the closest to the true posterior distribution. Actually, this is a very fruitful concept because it allows us to convert a uh, Bayesian inference problem to optimization problem. And we know how to solve large-scale optimization problems. So the next are some details. Uh, it can be easily shown that uh, uh, minimization of uh, KL divergence is completely equivalent to the maximization of the following quantity, uh, which has special name, uh, elbow, or evidence or bound. Uh, so it has this form on the last uh, line. Uh, and uh, it has several very nice properties. So first of all, of course, we still can't compute this elbow exactly because this is still an integral in a huge dimensional space. But we no longer need to compute the integral actually. All we need to do is to solve the optimization problem. So all we need to do is to find uh, the best value of phi. And it appears surprisingly that uh, we may uh, find phi more or less efficiently uh, even without being able to, to compute uh, the function itself. So we may optimize the function without uh, knowing how to compute it exactly. This can be achieved by using our modern optimization tools, so-called stochastic optimization, when uh, all we need to do is to uh, uh, know how to compute uh, stochastic gradients. And uh, for this particular function, it appears that uh, stochastic gradients can be computed quite efficiently. Uh, so instead of computing integral, we simply remove it with a Monte Carlo estimate. Uh, also, please note that, mm, let's how pity that, do you see, no, no. I'm afraid uh, we can't see other point, but anyway. Uh, please know that a uh, sub-integral equation consists of a, uh, a log likelihood at the training set. And since this is a logarithm of training likelihood, uh, it splits to the sum with respect to all objects in our training set. And then we may perform mini-batching. So we may uh, switch to mini-batches of data. And then 
it means that at each iteration of our stochastic optimization, uh, we do not need to compute the whole training likelihood, which is uh, quite expensive computation. All we need to compute is to compute training likelihood at mini batch. Then the each iteration of our stochastic optimization becomes extremely cheap, and we may afford a huge number of iterations. So this is good. Uh, another nice property is that uh, we can't overfit if we use uh, variational inference, because the richer is our parametric family phi, uh, the closer we are to the true posterior distribution. And true posterior distribution contains all relevant information about uh, the values of W given training data. So there's no risk of overfitting, uh, which is a standard problem when we deal with the point estimates, when we try to find just single classifier instead of training uh, the whole ensemble. And finally, uh, we may rewrite uh, ELBA as follows, the last line. Uh, we may split it into two terms. Uh, the first term is a standard data term, so it, 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 it reflects the log likelihood at the training sta uh, stage. Uh, and the second term uh, can be interpreted as a sum regularizer. So this regularizer prevents us uh, from collapsing to delta function. Let's consider the first term. And let's uh, imagine that uh, we have uh, uh, we have removed second term. So if we, if we uh, optimize just the first term, uh, it can be or more or less easily seen that uh, then we would converge to delta function. Uh, so our Q distribution would become delta function uh, at the maximum likelihood point. So we would simply converge to maximum likelihood point if we uh, optimize just the first term. So the second term, this is scale divergence between our variation approximation and the prior, prevents us from doing this. So uh, this is why it can be interpreted as a, some kind of regular, uh, regularization. And uh, uh, with this understanding, uh, we come to a new notion of regularization. So traditionally, uh, regularization uh, was uh, considered as, a, uh, um, as addition of some term, of some regularizer, uh, which corrects our function of what, uh, which we are going to optimize. So that in, in, in traditional formulation, uh, we had training error or training log likelihood. We add some additional term and uh, we, we, we try to optimize uh, these terms. Uh, we, we, we try to find uh, the most probable value of W. Now we have different uh, formulation. We are not trying to, to, to find single W. We are searching for the whole ensemble uh, by optimizing with respect to parameters phi, which denote our variation approximation. Uh, so the, the, the concept is a bit different, and it can be shown that actually the, the, the second understanding of regularization uh, corresponds to injecting some noise during uh, our training. And this is where dropout arises. So as uh, many of you probably know, uh, dropout is a quite popular regularization procedure. It was invented several years ago. It was uh, purely heuristic. Uh, the idea was pretty simple. Uh, we simply add, added uh, uh, multiplicative noise, either Bernoulli noise or Gaussian noise, uh, at each iteration of our uh, stochastic optimization uh, training uh, when we train uh, deep neural networks. Uh, so surprisingly, it worked. It really prevented overfitting. It really improved generalization ability. The reasons why it worked uh, remained unknown until very recently. Uh, but all we know that uh, injecting noise corresponds to some regularization and prevents overfitting. Uh, so about a year and a half ago, a uh, team from University of Amsterdam decided to understand why it really works. What, is, what lies uh, in the core of the power procedure? And since they were Bayesian, just as, as, as myself, uh, they decided to solve a reverse engineering problem and to understand whether dropout corresponds to some Bayesian procedure. So as we, as we know in variational Bayes, we are optimizing ELBA. So they decided to understand whether uh, there exists such ELBA that its optimization is equivalent to dropout training. And surprisingly, it appeared that uh, it can be interpreted uh, as false. Uh, so we may uh, write down ELBA, uh, and we see that the first term is really uh, corresp corresponding to Gaussian dropout. So if our variation approximation is Gaussian, uh, then the first term, if we, if we optimize the first term with respect to theta, uh, we'll get exactly Gaussian dropout training. But here there's also a second term, Carroll divergence. 
Uh, optimization elbow means optimizing uh, with respect to, 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 to both terms. But in Gaussian dropout, we're optimizing just the first term. So then, what is the relation with the Bayesian methods? Uh, and the very fruitful debut idea was the following. Let us try to invent such prior distribution, P of W, that the second term, Carol divergence, will not depend on theta. Theta is the mean of our variational approximation. Uh, if we can uh, invent such prior distribution, then we may show that uh, this L, the optimization of this elbow with respect to theta will correspond, will be completely equivalent to the Gaussian dropout. And uh, here's the answer. It appears that such prior distribution really exists. Uh, this is so-called uh, non-informative log uniform prior. And uh, what is curious is that uh, it has some meaningful interpretation. So uh, this improper distribution, which is proportional to 1 over absolute value of W, uh, actually penalizes the accuracy with which we find the particular values of the weights. So the more accurate we are, the more penalty we pay uh, for this extra accuracy. So this is quite a reasonable interpretation. And with this interpretation, we may uh, show that uh, the second term here depends only on alpha. Alpha defines the magnitude of the noise uh, which, which corresponds to dropout rate. Uh, the magnitude of noise we inject uh, during dropout training. So, and uh, we may easily show that the second term depends only on alpha and does not depend on theta. This means that if we fix alpha, then this ELB optimization becomes completely equivalent to Gaussian dropout training. And now we, go, uh, we may go even further. Uh, so now we have our ELBA consists of two terms. Data term depends on theta and alpha, and KL term depends only on alpha. And we try to optimize it with respect to theta given alpha fixed. But then, why should we fix alpha? Can't we optimize with respect to alpha as well? And the answer is yes. After we have interpreted dropout as a Bayesian procedure, we may easily optimize it both with respect to theta and alpha, because uh, the optimization with respect to these uh, variational parameters will correspond uh, to finding better and better approximation for the uh, posterior distribution. Uh, so we may find the power traits, we may find the magnitude of noise we need to inject in an optimal manner, not uh, setting it manually. But then we may go even further. Uh, remember that uh, theta, we have different values of theta for different weights. Uh, because, well, we're optimizing with respect to, to, to the weights. But uh, in dropout setting, uh, we have single dropout rate or single magnitude of noise we inject uh, to each neuron. But actually, now we can easily uh, generalize model and inject different magnitudes of noise to different uh, weights. So we easily assign uh, uh, individual dropout rate, individual alpha to each weight. And we may still optimize with respect to alpha ij and theta ij. We are still optimizing our elbow. Uh, now quite nice property. Uh, we may show, we may prove uh, the corresponding theorem that if alpha ij goes to infinity, then theta ij, the mean of our variational approximation, will go to zero in such a way that alpha times theta squared will also go to zero. So this means that in our Gaussian, there will be zero mean and zero variance. And this is exactly delta function at zero. If in our posterior distribution uh, some weights uh, uh, have delta function at zero, this means that we may simply remove these weights without uh, losing anything. And surprisingly, if we, st if we run this procedure, uh, we go to extremely sparse solution where 99.9% uh, of the weights uh, converge to delta function at zero. This is a very interesting phenomena. Uh, it's illustrated here. So this, uh, we took uh, Linnet 5 uh, neural network, uh, which consists of convolutional layers and uh, fully connected layers. And we, and, uh, uh, we apply this uh, variational dropout during training. So we see that, uh, we, we see that uh, in fully connected layers, almost all weights go to zero. And in the convolutional layers, also the, the most of, of the weights go to zero. This means that uh, this is quite efficient way for, rem for removing redundancy in modern deep neural architectures. It is widely known that uh, modern deep neural networks are highly redundant. The problem is that uh, we can't train them uh, with the same accuracy if we take smaller deep neural network. We'll lose accuracy. Uh, so the idea is uh, let us take uh, 
state-of-the-art deep neural network. Then we may train it with a high accuracy, and then we remove redundancy from there by, well, uh, uh, performing variation on dropout and uh, by moving the most of the weights to delta functions. So please see that uh, the accuracy, uh, which is shown on the top, uh, d doesn't drop. So we remove the weights, but we still keep the same accuracy, the same state-of-the-art accuracy. And this effect is observed on uh, uh, numerous deep neural architectures, not just on uh, Lynette 5, but on uh, uh, more complicated architectures as well. So this is quite a nice thing. Another uh, nice property is that uh, if we try to repeat famous experiment which was carried uh, in the beginning of this year uh, with permutated labels, uh, when uh, state-of-the-art uh, DNNs were trained on image classification problem where the class labels were randomly permuted. So there was absolutely no dependency between the image and the class label. But surprisingly, uh, all state-of-the-art DNNs have, trained, uh, have been trained successfully, so they have showed uh, zero level at the, training, uh, uh, at the training set. So this means catastrophic overfitting. Of course, uh, they had accuracy comparable with the random guess on the test set because there was no dependency between uh, uh, class label and the image itself. But uh, on the training set, they have overfitted. If we try to uh, perform the same experiment with the Bayesian variation on dropout, uh, we, we obtain a different answer. All the weights are removed from neur neural network. So neural network re uh, rejects from uh, solving this problem, uh, re refuses to solve this problem. Uh, so it reflects that uh, there is no dependency between the image and the class label. So this is, very, uh, this is also a quite nice property. So and to conclude, uh, what I wanted to, to, to show, what I wanted to convince you, is that uh, the com combination of uh, deep learning with a scalable Bayesian uh, framework is extremely fruitful. Uh, so now we also have a Bayesian interpretation, well, not, not, not us, but uh, other research group have invented Bayesian interpretation for binary dropout, which corresponds to Bernoulli noise. Uh, we have Bayesian interpretation for generative, ad generative adversarial networks. Uh, and probably in recent years, uh, we'll see some more newer Bayesian methods. Even the first attempts of uh, applying Bayesian uh, methods to deep learning uh, already show quite promising results. Uh, and to conclude, uh, I just wanted to, to, to uh, say that uh, in August, we're organizing summer school in Moscow on deep uh, Bayesian methods. Although registration is closed, uh, but uh, all lectures will be available online, so you are welcome. And if you are interested, please visit our poster, which contains more details about this uh, Bayesian dropout procedure. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Dmitry. Uh, we have a time for one or two short questions. Дмитрий, слышно, да? Спасибо за прекрасный доклад. У вас, кстати, очень интересные рассуждения на постнауке. И в рамке этих рассуждений uh, размышлений есть этого доклада Можно ли применить Is it possible to apply a Bayesian approach to solve problem of understanding, understanding of a human, why the neural network makes this or that decision? So the question was uh, whether we may apply Bayesian framework uh, for, uh, human for human understanding why deep neural network work works. So probably uh, the answer would be first, according to numerous biological uh, cognitive experiments, uh, the researchers showed that uh, human brain is actually Bayesian. So it applies some Bayesian mechanisms in it. Uh, and I think that uh, with this uh, well, um, sparsification of, of neural networks, with the removing of redundancies, uh, we may better understand why deep neural networks work. Uh, but of course, um, it is still a challenge. Okay, one more question. Thank you. 
Back in time, I've been involved in uh, calculation mathematics in the area of uh, tensile strength, and there is a method of limited elements, and the variational functionality is very similar to what you've been building here. Is it true or not? Because out there, uh, roughly speaking, a long time ago, they're applying mathematical approximation of these uh, probabilistic influences on a solid body and weights, weighting uh, through, well, they build a matrix of uh, tensile strengths of the rigidity matrix as weighting the uh, bias, uh, Bayesian. But this is for stochastic processes. But in the theory of dynamics and uh, strength, this is just a law. Uh, maybe uh, that matrix is always well expressed and the diagonal is the most important part of it. And uh, for you, uh, I didn't see this uh, diagonal as the main factor. Uh, why uh, you have such artificial distribution of which uh... Uh, so the question was uh, whether oh, uh, I, I will try to, to formulate it as I understood it uh, so the question was whether uh, these variational uh, approximations we are using have something common with the uh, variational formulations from finite elements method uh, so to tell the truth I'm not too familiar with finite elements method uh, so I'm afraid I cannot comment uh, in details on that uh, but what I, I may say is that uh, this variational formulation, of course, it, it is not novel. So it is uh, widely known and it is, it's been used in, in many uh, different applications, uh, this uh, variational error bounds. Uh, the novelty was that it was shown that uh, using this variational error bounds, we may uh, apply stochastic optimization framework, and hence we may uh, solve the corresponding optimization problem in a super efficient manner for uh, large-scale machine learning problems. So the variational formulation itself is, is known and is, is used in many areas. Uh, actually, the, the, as to, to the best of my knowledge, probably the first uh, guy who formulated uh, this uh, lower bound was uh, Hans Bethe, who was an astrophysicist and uh, Nobel Prize winner uh, in the in the middle of the uh, 20th century. Okay, so I think we have to move on. Uh, so let's thank Mitri again. And uh, so our next speaker is uh, uh, Konstantin Lachman. So Konstantin is a leading researcher at, Yan at Yandex, and he's going to talk about wide nets for all kinds of fish, making image features work in production. Please. Hi. Uh, well, basically, I'm not a, a researcher man, actually. I'm more a practical guy. And uh, there was two previous brilliant talks about the kind of a frontier in the research of a neural network and deep learning. And my talk was, uh, my talk will be full of practical hacks and uh, uh, practical considerations. And uh, first of all, I'm from the computer vision department at Yandex, and we are striving to uh, solve many computer vision problems that are necessary for all, sorry, uh, where is my presentation, sorry. So basically, we're trying to solve many computer vision problems that are necessary for all services across Yandex. As well, along with this, we are trying to improve our basic technologies for image and video analysis. Maybe you need a PowerPoint version or? Oh, uh, could you go to the first slide? Because it, this is not the first one. <laughs> oh, thank you. Oh, yeah. Uh, so today I would like to talk about the approach uh, to obtaining image features that will be suitable for many different target tasks that we face in the index. So first of all, I would like to briefly talk about main image analysis problem that we face. And uh, it is certainly uh, the similar images search. So we have a service uh, 
which you can query with, for example, a photo of a basketball player and uh, get a lot of semantically similar images on, as on this slide. To solve this task, we need to extract features from the image that, uh, on one hand, will allow us to find semantically relevant answers to an uh, uh, extremely wide range of user input photos. And on the other hand, will make it possible to dis distinguish between quite similar visual, visual objects, for example, different types of plants. Uh, within the similar images search, we also provide the user with so-called image tags. Uh, as you can see on this slide, again, we should work well on many different domains while, uh, trying, to, uh, f while trying to assign very specific tags uh, rather than just generalized image classes. So, for example, on the left query, we were able to identify the exact printer model uh, based on the input image. And now we're actively trying to solve a localization problem. As you all know, this task is much more complicated than just an image classification. Uh, however, the solution of this problem will allow us to better form the search result for the user queries. So, for example, when the user sends an image like this to our search engine, uh, what kind of uh, images uh, he would like to see in response, or more specifically, what is his intent, uh, whether it will uh, want to look at images of Elon Musk, or maybe it wants to get a, uh, an images of a Tesla car. We don't know. Uh, so this was some kind of problems that we face. And now I would like to discuss what kind of difficulties uh, we can get in the production when trying to solve this task at large scale. First problem that immediately pops up is a problem of small data sets. It is very usual that some internal c uh, customer comes to us and uh, with a need to uh, make a classifier of some kind, some kind of specific classifier. And uh, at the same time, he has at best several thousand images uh, as a training for this classifier. Of course, it is almost impossible to train from scratch a, a large convolutional neural network on such a small data set uh, because of the overfitting effect. Uh, so we must be able to somehow solve such tasks with appropriate quality, avoiding overfitting. The second problem is the number of images that need to be processed by our networks uh, in the production. There are tens of billions of images in our search index. And uh, this means that with every update of the, our algorithms, uh, we must process all these images uh, within a reasonable period of time. Moreover, we crawl, we crawl uh, hundreds of millions of new images every day uh, and it is important to quickly add them to the index along with the results of our algorithms. Actually, both problems that I, that I mentioned uh, have one common solution which is well known across professional community. Uh, this approach is called transfer learning. At the first stage, on the left, uh, we train our main large convolutional network on some very large data set of images, for example, an ImageNet. And we expect that the features uh, of one of the last layers, for example, this uh, green layer on the top, uh, will contain all necessary semantic information about an arbitrary image. And after that, we use the outputs of this layer to uh, train on top of them many classifiers uh, on all our target tasks. Uh, basically, we freeze layers uh, below this one and do not fine-tune them during training of our target classifiers. Uh, so due to a sharp reduction of the complexity of the model, this allows us to avoid overfitting in most of the cases. In addition, uh, and it is very important for our tasks, we do not need to run separate convolutional networks uh, for each task, but can use a set of convolutions that, is co that are common for all of these networks. Uh, this, uh, uh, using this technology, we can consider considerably reduce time that is needed to process each image in the index. In this approach, the quality of our basic model, this green uh, width, uh, becomes critically important. Uh, this quality is heavily dependent on a original training data set. So the initial data set uh, on which we, like many others actually, trained the base model for uh, was ImageNet with a thousand of different classes. Uh, 
uh, there are many problems with this data set. Uh, first, a thousand classes are far not enough. There is a lot more objects in the world. And uh, secondly, ImageNet is extremely biased towards wildlife. Uh, it is quite fine-graded when we speak about, uh, for example, different animal species. But it is quite sparse and uh, too general for, uh, in other domains, for example, in the domain of electronics. It turns out that the content of this data set uh, does not correspond to the main user topics that users want to search in our search engine. So the first problem we can solve, if we will take not a small image net, as in the first example, uh, but the whole image net with entire available word net class hierarchy. If we try to carefully select the set of entities, trying to uh, avoid class intersections, we could get a new data set with about 10 million images and about, uh, divided into about 10,000 classes. This is much better, but still does not solve the bias problem. Some time ago, a new large data set consisting of Flickr user photos uh, was published. Uh, this base consists of approx approximately 60 million images divided into, uh, with uh, user tags that are associated with each image. So, however, it is impossible to use these tags as classes without preprocessing uh, because there are uh, there are quite a lot of absolutely non-visual tags, for example, camera model. In addition, there are many synonymous tags, or even identical tags, but, but in different spelling. If we apply some methods for aggregating and filtering these tags, we could get data set with from 1,000 to 10,000 classes, depending on chosen method. Uh, this is also not enough for our, ta for our tasks. We would like to have an order of magnitude more classes in our data set. So we can try to apply a somewhat different approach to the selection of classes from the same Flickr data set. Uh, photos in the data set uh, also have some, some descriptions. We can consider all the individual words in the descriptions to be in some sense multiple images classes. Uh, of course, first we need to tokenize this text, remove the most frequent words, and then take, for example, 100,000 most frequent words and interpret them as labels. So, for example, this like, image on the left is uh, going to have labels veranda, hotel, particle, and palma. So, okay, this is fine, but what might be wrong with direct selection of classes from words in the text? Uh, first, it would lead to a large amount of noisy labels. Again, there is a lot of synonymous words uh, that are difficult to merge automatically. Also, in the description of images, there are maybe words that are either uh, difficult, uh, that are either do not, relate, uh, do not directly relate it to the image itself, or are difficult to predict uh, based on solely image content. Uh, such noise in the training data will uh, greatly complicate the optimization problem. Secondly, we'll have to somehow limit the number of words that we take as classes. Uh, in the simple case, we can just cut our vocabulary based on some kind of a frequency threshold. Uh, but it's, it is likely that many of the concepts that we are interested in will be below this frequency concepts, uh, th this frequency threshold. Sorry, uh, we can try to select a set of, a set of concepts of interest in a smarter way. For example, choose only nouns or words that denote some kind of object. But in any way, uh, this approach will require a lot of manual work. And, well, the third, the third problem uh, that we will face is a complex concept. So this is a concept that are either difficult to express in one word or that are described by multi-word idiom. A very good example is the chocolate factory Red October, actually, which is near us. Uh, because, or some movie caption. Because neither of the separate words describe the concept, uh, the whole concept. So are there any other ways to determine the set of classes? A very important aspect that I would like to point out, that the, for the vast majority of the, our target tasks, we do not need uh, named or in general human interpretable labels because we want to use these models only as a proxy for other tasks. 
Let's consider the case in which there is corresponding text to every image, like in a Flickr data set. We could use some method to take all of these descriptions and cluster them into a fixed number of clusters. Uh, then we might use resulting clusters as classes of entities. In the case of Yandex, users query our search engine with tens of millions unique queries per day and then click on some images on the resulting page. And we could consider uh, these queries to be in some sense descriptions for clicked images. Ideally, we would like to have clusters like this. Uh, in these clusters we can separate, for example, very uh, far away classes like horse and, mob and mobile phone. But ideally we would like to separate even uh, photos of horse and drowning of horse because this is a very, uh, this is kind of very uh, different visual concepts. Obviously, first approach to clustering user queries is to transform it into some kind of high dimensional vector space using some kind of distributed embeddings for words like word to work or glove. To obtain a representation for a query, we just sum up individual representations of each word in the query. This is a very common practice. Uh, then we could use, for example, k means algorithm to cluster these embeddings. This slide shows a fairly typical example of the resulting cluster. Uh, sorry, this is in Russian, but I mean, <laughs> it's hard to translate all of these queries in English. Um, so one can see that in general, we get, we get quite similar queries in this cluster, yeah? So this is uh, images of some animals. However, in this case, syntactic similarities affect the results much more than semantic ones. We can see queries about tiger, about an elephant, and about a frog, and much more. We would like to have more fine-graded classes. So at least it turned out that the clustering approach somehow works. It remains to understand how we can get better representation for queries. And we again decided to somehow utilize click data. After a user sends query to the search engine, he might click on the different images. Users click more on some images and less on the others. On average, this may indicate the degree of relevance uh, between an image and a query. We can take the entire click history and for each pair of, uh, of request and image, calculate the so-called CTRs. Uh, so CTR is basically the ratio between a uh, number of clicks on, the th on this image and number of times that this image was shown in response to a particular query. Uh, for example, on this slide we, uh, we use as, a, as an example a query racehorse and there is a free uh, corresponding images and this is a CTR so we can see that uh, the, for example the, uh, the drowning of the horse is uh, is clicked much less than, for example, a, a photo of a racehorse. Um, so basically, then we can calculate for each of this image uh, features from one of our previ previous neural networks, from one of our previous models. Uh, and then we can get the embedding of a query, but just a width summation of these features uh, taking into account corresponding CTRs, yeah? Uh, and this is how we basically get uh, an embedding for a, for a text uh, based on uh, an image representation of this text. Uh, it is important to understand that in order to obtain a more reliable representations for queries, we need at least some minimal click history for it. For, uh, for it. Therefore, we had to discard all requests that was asked less than a certain number of times. So again, one of the clusters uh, using these images, features, embeddings uh, are shown on this slide. This is a cluster about main Kuhn cat breed. Yep. So we are able to merge into this cluster many different spellings, uh, including grammatically incorrect. However, if we had a look for the closest cluster to this one, uh, then we will find a virtually identical cluster filled with the same main Kuhn queries but in a slightly different formulations. Uh, we would certainly like that all these requests 
fall into the same cluster, then the network would not have to try to distinguish these uh, two visually identical classes. So, after more detailed study of the structure of the resulting clusters, it turned out that this is not an unusual case, actually. This is a frequent problem. If we plot the distribution of intercluster and intercluster distances, we get the graph like this. And we can see that first, uh, these two t distributions are heavily intersected. And second, it turns out that the average intercluster distance, so that means the average distance between points that belong to this cluster, to the centroid, is even smaller than the is even larger than the uh, distance between uh, two nearest centroids. So it is possible that this is some kind of artifact of the linear k-means algorithm that we are using for clustering. However, we decided that we can take the resulting cluster and try to merge the most similar ones. There are many ways actually to determine which cluster we would like to merge, but we use the following approach. We have tried to uh, merge clusters with large amount of points that are placed near the cluster boundaries. Uh, so, for example, these points uh, belong to one of the cluster. Sorry, do I have? Yep. Oh, okay. So, for example, on image on the right, uh, there are some points uh, that belong to one of these two clusters, but the, differences bet uh, but the difference between the distances to the next nearest centroid does not exceed very, yep, uh, a very uh, little amount, for example, 100. So the distribution of distances to the nearest centroids uh, is shown on the left. Uh, we removed from consideration object with distances to the nearest clusters that exceed this red line. Uh, we did it because we actually interested uh, in merging small clusters in a very dense region of space, and these points are not interested for us. So basically, as a result, we utilize the following approach. For example, we would like to get 100,000 uh, clusters uh, in final. To do this, we can initially cluster the space into, let's say, 150,000 uh, classes. Uh, and then sequentially merge the clusters uh, with the largest number of these shared boundary points. So far, we uh, have automatically selected uh, a set of 100,000 classes. To fill these classes with images, we're going to take images that were shown and clicked uh, by user in response to some query. Sometimes it turned out that there are f too few images, and then we just threw away this cluster. Sometimes, in contrast, there are too many such images in, in some of the clusters, and then we just took a fixed number of them with the largest CTRs. Uh, quite often, one image falls into several clusters. Uh, in such a situation, we assign it to a cluster in which it had the largest CTR. As a result, we obtain distribution of cluster sizes that is shown on the slide, with the median size of the cluster is about 600 images. So, well, okay, let's move on to the real results. Uh, so as a baseline, I would like to show you the error that we obtained uh, after training on this data set, uh, for example, for ResNet 50. Uh, well, it's slightly uh, above 80 uh, percent. And it might seem that this is kind of a very bad classification error, right? But remember that we are not interested in this classification error. We are interested in our target classification errors on target tasks. And so on this slide, I present comparison between our previous basic, da uh, basic data set, ImageNet 10K, and one that I described today. Uh, basically, there are several classifiers that was trained on top of features from two different base networks. As you can see, in the case of relatively complex classifiers, uh, such as clothing, for example, uh, we have obtained a very significant growth in the accuracy metric. However, in the case of some simple classifiers, like, uh, for example, a porn classifier, we didn't observe any growth. This is all certainly interesting, uh, but all these classifiers are quite specific. Uh, 
And our task was to significantly improve the quality of our algorithms on a very wide range of user topics simultaneously. To check uh, whether we really improve our base ne neural network or not, we could have a look at the aggregated metric for quality of similar images search. This is a very simple metric. Uh, we have a limited number of images as queries, and then we try, uh, and then we use as an assessor, so people who estimate how relevant our search result in response to these queries. According to this metric, when we switch to, oh, sorry. Why? Uh, there should be next slide, yep, sorry. Uh, yeah, so according to this metric, when we switched from the, our previous data set to this one, to clusters data set, we got an increase in 10%, which to be honest was a great leap for us. Uh, we went a bit further and tried to train the network simultaneously on these two data sets. It doesn't work? Okay, thanks. Uh, and surprise, surprise, we got an another 10% improvement. In general, this means that the cluster, the cluster's data, database is still not a superset of ImageNet. And uh, it is beneficial to use both of them for training. Okay, and the last slide, so with the take home points and I will briefly run through it. So first of all, it's quite obvious for all professionals that transfer learning, the transfer learning is a way to quickly train models on a small uh, uh, data sets without overfitting. Uh, secondly, we can dramatically reduce computation time for a single image by sharing heavy convolutional layers for many tasks. Uh, I think that, uh, at least I'm, I was trying to convince you that we do not need named entities in our data set to train a base neural network model. And well, the more classes entities, the better is final quality. So thank you very much. Okay, thanks, Konstantin. You have any questions? I will publish on your large data set. Uh, Whoa, I expect this question. <laughs> Um, uh, are we going to publish this data set? Um, I don't know. Actually, I, I don't have an answer for this question because uh, this is our internal data set and, well, at least for now, we do not have plans to recently publish it. Other questions? So, if I'm to understand correctly, you are representing your images in the feature space where the words describing the images are features, right? But, and the uh, clickability as a distance from the, from the, you know, from the mean or from the word that describes, right? So, how would you counter that some images by their own nature is uh, like more clickable like if you're searching for some image, uh, image and you see the other image that is not uh, that is not described but th by this word you input in the search, uh, su search query uh, but is more interesting for uh, average person you know how would you control this kind of uh, mistake during the search uh, well basically I'm, I'm not sure that I'm fully understand this question but I will try to answer I, I could uh, rephrase in, in Russian if you like sorry I could <laughs> I could repeat it in Russian oh, if you like yeah if it's possible because uh, вы представляете изображение как объекты uh, в пространстве вот этом семантическом, uh, ну то есть в пространстве слов, грубо говоря, где вот слова как признаки. Но вот некоторые изображения могут быть более интересны пользователю просто в своей природе, хотя они связаны с вот словом, которое он вбивал запрос. То есть это известная проблема. Вы ищете что-то по каким-то словам, а вдруг видите что-то интересное. Вот некоторые изображения 
просто, в принципе, более интересно. Okay, okay, как вы такую ошибку устраняете? What we, uh, what we do, uh, so there's a very frequent situation, for example, when uh, a user makes a query and then see a result page with several images, and then there are, of course, in, uh, images that are relevant to this query, and then suddenly there is an images that are not relevant to this query, but in some sense more interesting or more attractive to the, to the user, and then, it, uh, and then the user clicks on this image, and this is kind of a noise in our click data. Uh, yeah, for sure we always uh, face this problem because click data is very noisy and moreover, actually, uh, this CTR's level is heavily dependent on the type of the, u of the queries because, for example, on some queries, user do not click on any image uh, so the problem of user is solving just by looking at the result page and for some queries, uh, user usually clicks on some image images to see it in a full size. Yeah, so we are trying to apply some kind of uh, filtering methods, so for example, filtering uh, normal values of the CTRs, for example, too high or too low, or maybe that are uh, not in the free sigma, for example, uh, uh, from the mean value, so some kind of these methods. Okay. One more short question. Вы показывали слайд, где, ну и говорили о том, что вам не нужно строго формализовать метки, ну формализовать аннотации, достаточно их классифицировать. Вы можете там, где вот у вас красным, розовым кружочком овалами были, да, yeah, uh, метод классификации uh, so такой, можете как-то подробнее uh, объяснить? Окей, so basically uh, most of the time uh, the open data sets consist of images that are labeled with uh, named entity, yeah, so we, we can associate with each image some named label. And our approach is to uh, try to uh, go a little bit further. So basically, we do not need these named labels. We just need uh, a, set of, a set of texts that somehow represent the concepts. So we don't need to merge this uh, set of texts into one word. We just need to have a representative uh, text from the cluster. And uh, this is how we actually uh, found this set of concepts. Okay, let's thank Konstantin again. Thank you. And uh, our next and uh, last speaker of this session is uh, Alexander Chigorin, who is a leading researcher in the Vision Labs. And Alexander is going to talk about uh, pushing neural networks to production on different platforms, uh, common problems and possible solutions. Thank you. Okay, hello everyone. Um, in this talk, I want to uh, discuss some practical aspects that arise uh, when you're trying to push your already trained model to, to the user. So it's uh, common in production when you want to, your model to be applied somewhere and, and be uh, and be of interest to, you, to the user. So let's uh, review the typical pipeline that arises in deep learning. Uh, you typically train your model on GPU, and uh, it's very powerful, it have uh, quite a lot of memory, and uh, can compute uh, crunch uh, neural networks quite fast. And uh, then, after you train your model, you want to, it to run on different devices, uh, such as in the cloud, or maybe in mobile phones, or inside surveillance cameras, or even maybe in the browsers. So all the or you want to touch all the users you can with your model. And uh, there are several practical aspects that arise when you're trying to uh, deliver your model to the users. And uh, I, I will review not all of them, but some. Uh, the first one is the model size. And uh, by meaning the model size, we can speak about two things. The model size of the model file. Uh, this, this is how many bytes uh, 
our model should be uh, if we want to uh, transfer it to the user and uh, make it work. And uh, the second uh, uh, thing is the model size in the random access memory. So in some devices you have a little memory and uh, if you want to run uh, your big model that you trained on GPU, uh, you should take some care of it. Uh, model file size is uh, especially uh, interesting in uh, mobile phones, for example, when uh, you have your app and if you want to embed a neural network inside, you don't want your app to grow 100 or 200 of megabytes. And uh, the second uh, common issue is the inference speed. So uh, as I said, uh, you typically train on GPU and uh, this is quite a uh, fast device. And uh, when you move to mobile phones or even CPUs, uh, you uh, see a big drop in uh, inference speed and uh, sometimes you need to deal with it. And the uh, last uh, problem is the battery consumption. So how many, uh, uh, how, how hungry is your model for the battery of the device? And uh, again, in mobile phones and embedded pl platforms is uh, quite, uh, uh, quite the issue with the neural networks. So in this talk, I will uh, cover two things, uh, model file size and inference speed. And I'll review some recent papers that uh, uh, quite easy to implement and uh, may give you some possibilities to push your model to mo more devices. And uh, let's uh, begin. It's, uh, so the first uh, uh, problem is the model si file size issue. And uh, here is the motivation table. Uh, in this table you can see typical uh, uh, state-of-the-art uh, neural network architectures uh, with uh, number of parameters in it and the uh, size of the model. And uh, also the accuracy of these arch architectures on the ImageNet data set. Uh, ImageNet is a state-of-the-art data set for measuring how uh, good your classifier, your image classifier is. Uh, so we can uh, uh, approximately split this uh, table into two parts. The first part uh, is the top one uh, and uh, here we have uh, big models that have a big model size but also have a good ac accuracy on ImageNet. Uh, and uh, the second part is the uh, bottom one is a model that's quite small. Uh, for, for example, tiny darknet, darknet is a very small model, but we also see that accuracy on ImageNet is uh, not so good uh, for these types of models. So, uh, what if we want it all? If we, what if we want uh, our model to be small and uh, also accurate as uh, models from the top part, part of the uh, table? And uh, there is several research uh, papers uh, that uh, allow us, uh, that uh, answers this question positively and uh, uh, shows how, to, uh, how we can compress our model uh, by the factor of 30 or 50 without significant loss in accuracy. I will, I will review two of them and, uh, okay, let's begin. The first one is a paper from uh, NVIDIA Stanford guys uh, and uh, uh, the idea here is uh, quite simple. Uh, uh, let's try to find the weights in, the, in our neural network that is not important for the inference. So they, not, uh, they do not influence the accuracy of the model if we delete them. Mathematically, this means that we zero them out and uh, then use some compression algorithm that you, uh, can compress sparse data, our sparse weight matrix uh, efficiently. And uh, the question here is uh, what is the measure of importance of the weight? And uh, uh, we can measure importance of the weight, for example, using variation dropout, as Dmitry Vetrov already discussed. But I, here I want to review a more simple technique uh, that also works quite well in practice. And uh, the authors of the papers suggest to use uh, uh, weight absolute value as a measure of weight importance. Uh, and the uh, iterative algorithm of uh, compressing, uh, pruning our network, uh, zeroing out the weights, looks as following. Uh, at, at the beginning, we we'll have already trained model that uh, have a, a good uh, accuracy on uh, some uh, data set of interest. And uh, we want uh, to compress as much, uh, to zero out as much weights as possible on this model. Uh, so we uh, try, we, we begin with uh, our initial weights matrix and uh, then find the weights uh, in this matrix that have the smallest uh, absolute values uh, and uh, zero them out. Uh, this is shown as green, uh, uh, green uh, weights. Uh, after this, uh, the accuracy on our target data set uh, is uh, 
has dropped because we modified uh, already trained model and we want uh, our network to give a chance to adapt to these modifications so we will retrain uh, the remaining weights uh, the ones that we haven't zero out yet and uh, try to uh, try to increase our accuracy to the previous level and uh, after this, we will repeat the same steps again. We will zero out uh, weights uh, that have the smallest value, retrain the network, and do it iteratively until we reach uh, the desired uh, compression rate of our network, or uh, our accuracy is so low that we can't afford to zero out weights more. And uh, uh, these simple techniques uh, technique g give uh, quite uh, good compression rates already. So for typical uh, uh, net, uh, neural network architectures, we can see uh, like 10, 10 times reduction in the model file size uh, and uh, with a little uh, uh, drop in accuracy. And uh, it's also interesting to inspect uh, these models, compressed models layer-wise. And uh, if we uh, make a visualization of uh, how many compressed weights we have in different layers of the network. We'll see that in uh, convolutional layers, uh, we have most of the weights, uh, which is compressed to some, something like 60%. And uh, the main compression uh, is taking part in the uh, fully connected layers, where we have a lot of weights, and we can compress them to, and, and we com can compress 96% of uh, uh, these weights. Uh, so the second uh, paper I want to review is uh, uh, from the same authors and uh, they built on the idea of the first paper uh, by uh, additionally uh, something wrong uh, uh, by additionally adding two steps uh, at the f after pruning uh, and uh, the algorithm looks as following we uh, start from uh, zeroing out the weights or pruning and uh, as, uh, as, as I said I discussed before then we uh, use weight quantization uh, and uh, Huffman encoding. I will uh, go through these steps uh, in detail in, on the following slides. So the pruning part is the same. After pruning, you get uh, the model that uh, has a lot of zero weights. And uh, typically, it's more than 90% of the weights of the model that are zeroed out. And uh, then you uh, start to quantize your network. Uh, uh, the, here, the idea and the goal is simple. Uh, we know that uh, uh, a lot of uh, compression algorithms benefit from uh, having a lot of duplicates in, in the data. And uh, uh, here we want to increase the duplication number in our weights. And we will do it uh, uh, by clustering the weights. Uh, it's, uh, we again start with the initial uh, weights matrix. and. Uh, cluster the weights in the, in the way that uh, the similar weights are clustered together into the same cluster. Uh, different clusters here are shown by different colors. Then we uh, ca count uh, the centroid for each cluster and uh, uh, we'll replace all the weights from the cluster with its centroid. So after doing this, uh, you can see that uh, that's not working. Uh, we ca you can see that uh, we have uh, a lot of duplicate uh, weights in our network, uh, and uh, the weights from the same cluster are the same. And uh, this is already a good uh, starting point to compress uh, our weights matrix because there are a lot of duplicate data, and uh, if we run some state-of-the-art compression algorithm, we can expect the good compression rates. Uh, but uh, by doing this procedure, we have also uh, lowered uh, the accuracy of our model. So again, we will uh, make network to adapt to this change by retraining it uh, on the, our target data set, uh, by fine-tuning only centroids of, uh, we, of our cl clusters. And uh, by doing this, uh, we uh, apply sharing uh, restriction to the weights, so on the, change, the weights from the same cluster change uh, simultaneously and uh, don't diverge from the same value. Uh, this uh, step uh, can allow us to uh, r uh, to get to the accuracy that we had before this procedure. And uh, after this step, we have a weight matrix with a lot of duplicate values. Uh, so the last uh, thing we want to do with it is to run some compression algorithm 
uh, to uh, get our compressed model. And uh, there are a lot of possibilities uh, we can choose. Uh, but if you look at the uh, distribution of our weights uh, in the weight matrix, we'll see that there are a lot of weights with, uh, with, uh, that uh, encounter quite frequently and a uh, small number of weights uh, that inc we, c we, c we can encounter ra rarely. And uh, uh, there is a co encoding algorithm called the Huffman coding uh, that we can use here because uh, it assigns a small number of bits to the most frequent weights, uh, to, to the most frequent values in our data, and uh, more bits to the rest, less frequent values. And uh, this is a good fit uh, for this unbalanced data distribution. And by doing so, uh, we can, on, on the same models uh, from the previous paper, we can expect uh, additional f almost three times uh, gain in compression rates. Uh, so for, for, for the same models, we get uh, 35 times and 49 times uh, gain in compression. Uh, this is uh, already quite okay for a lot of uh, different devices you want to push your model in. Uh, so so uh, this was the per first part. I hope that if you have some problems with the model size of your neural network, you can use these two simple techniques to uh, reduce it and uh, don't uh, drop an accuracy. Uh, the second part, part is the inference speed. So uh, the motivation table here is the following. Uh, we can compare uh, different devices by the uh, number of operations it can perform uh, in one second. And uh, if we compare uh, GPU f to other, to server CPUs, desktop CPUs, or uh, CPUs on the phones, we can see that uh, GPU is on, on the top, and uh, all other devices are uh, quite uh, slow comparing to your uh, top GPU. And for example, if you t take uh, the recent iPhone 7 Plus, uh, its processor can can uh, crunch the data uh, to almost uh, more than uh, 100 times slower than uh, your GPU you have trained on. So if you want to push your model to, to the iPhone, sometimes you need to take special steps to make it uh, run faster. And I will discuss several approaches that you can use. Uh, the first solution here can be a specialized architecture. So uh, instead of using uh, some state-of-the-art network, you, uh, you develop some uh, additional architecture that is uh, running faster on uh, GPU and consequently on CPUs and other devices. And the seminal work here was done in a paper called Rethinking the Inception Architecture for Computer Vision by the guys from Google. and. Uh, uh, they proposed three uh, ideas uh, of how to modify a convolutional neural network to make it faster. And uh, this is quite simple ideas. Uh, first one is uh, you can replace your uh, convolution, big convolutional filters with a stack of smaller ones. Uh, by doing this, you get the same receptive field uh, in, the, in, the, uh, in your filters, uh, but uh, you can, this uh, step can reduce uh, computations by almost 30% uh, in, in, in this case when we replace 5x5 five five convolution by the stack of 3x3 three three convolutions. Uh, the second step is similar, but you replace your squared filter uh, with a stack of uh, rectangular ones. Uh, it's also called separable filters. And, uh, you also get the same receptive field, uh, the, therefore the network is increased, but uh, you can reduce the number of computation by the factor of, by, by, by the 34 percent in this case. And uh, the last uh, step that was proposed is to uh, insert, inject uh, additional bottleneck layer in, inside our network uh, to reduce the number of channels in your filters. Uh, this uh, bottleneck uh, forces the network to propagate only the relevant information uh, through, through it and uh, uh, reduces the computational cost of your network by the factor of the number of uh, reduced uh, channels. So if you, if you had 128 channels, as in this example, and uh, inserted the re reduction bottleneck uh, represented as one by one convolution with 32 channels, you can get uh, the reduction of almost four uh, in the number of operations you should perform on your network. 
this is quite a big, uh, big reduction. Uh, this is three st simple steps that can you, you, you can use when you design your network to get it uh, more to get it perform more faster. And uh, there was a, a recently additional uh, trick was proposed. It was proposed simultaneously in three papers. It seems like a, it's a good indicator of its of what that is really work, and uh, it's called device convolution. Uh, just to recap, the, the standard convolution uh, is working is the following: you have your filter and you apply it to all the input channels of your image, and uh, by doing this, uh, you then sum up it, it sum uh, up uh, together the responses the responses for all the filters, and uh, it's your output. In device convolution, instead of applying uh, your filter to all the channels of the all the, all the input channels, you apply each filter to each uh, channel. So it's a massive reduction of computations. Uh, if you had uh, 100 channels, 100 input channels, uh, you get 100 uh, inference improvement in improvements of the speed and the number of operations by using device convolution. Uh, but uh, device convolution can't used, can be used alone because uh, uh, it does not combine information between the channels. So these three papers uh, propose to use uh, the combination of device convolution and one by one convolution when can uh, uh, recombine uh, the channels uh, that we have. Uh, so the trick here is to replace standard three by three convolution by the stack of uh, three by three device convolution and uh, additionally recombine the channels by one by one convolution. And in this example, uh, this simple uh, trick can uh, redu reduce the number of operations by almost uh, nine. It's also quite a big reduction. And uh, the authors of uh, one of the papers I review called Mobile Nets uh, uh, compared uh, this ar architecture consisting on, on, of only uh, device convolutions with standard ar architectures. And uh, uh, we can see that you can get uh, almost three times reductions in the number of operations. Uh, with the same accuracy on ImageNet. And uh, the second solution I want to discuss is uh, quantized networks. Uh, quantized networks is, ba uh, we, we already see, seen that uh, uh, qu qu weights quantization can work when you, we want to compress the networks, but it turn, turn out, turns out that we also can uh, uh, use quantized weights to increase the inference speed. And uh, it works if uh, our device has special uh, instruction sets for, for, uh, for multiplying quantized numbers. For example, in uh, typical situation, uh, our uh, weights are floating point numbers, uh, 332 bits, and uh, uh, we have a lot of uh, instructions to multiply it for the floating point numbers on the CPUs or GPUs, but uh, there is also some instructions on CPUs and GPUs that can use, uh, for example, 8-bit integer values uh, and uh, also multiply it and do it four times faster. And uh, if we can quantize our weights and activations in the network to these 8-bit values, uh, we can uh, get uh, the improvements in inference speed. So the first paper I want to review here is uh, uh, working with uh, the network for speech recognition uh, on CPUs. And uh, the authors proposed to convert the activations in the network to 8-bit integers and the weight uh, of the network to 8-bit signed integers. And also lift the biases as 32-bit integers, but uh, it's just technical details because uh, the instructions in the processor they used uh, uh, wanted as in, uh, these numbers as input. Uh, and uh, this uh, conversion was done by using uh, linear uh, range, uh, linear conver conversion. So we take a maximum and minimum value of our weights and uh, just uh, map it linearly to, to the uh, range co that corresponds to 8-bit values. Uh, and by using special instructions that is highlighted on the slide, uh, the authors uh, was able to get uh, almost three times reduction on the inference speed on uh, Intel CPUs uh, without uh, loss in accuracy. 
Uh, and uh, another possibility in uh, networks quantization is uh, uh, to go to extreme and uh, quantize uh, the weights and the activations in the network to just one bit. So your weights and uh, activations can take only two values, plus one or, min one or minus one. And uh, this uh, type of techniques uh, is also explored in, in the research. Here are the two papers, recent papers about this. And uh, uh, s so it's uh, like the same slide. Uh, you convert activations to plus mi mi one or minus one, and those weights to plus minus or minus one, and use uh, special instructions on the CPU uh, or another processor. Uh, that can uh, multiply these bit vectors much faster than uh, their floating points counterparts. In theory, we can get uh, 30 times uh, in, uh, 30 times inference speed improvement by using uh, quantized uh, one bit vectors, uh, because uh, instead of uh, 32 bits, we use just one, and uh, we can um, multiply 32 times more values in, in this case. And uh, there was a question uh, if it's uh, really possible on current uh, software, uh, on current hardware and software. And uh, the recent paper uh, showed uh, uh, that uh, it's really possible if you quantize your network to just one bit, uh, you can use uh, uh, the instruction sets from SEC4 on Intel's CPU and uh, get uh, more than 10 times improvement in inf inference speed compared to flo floating points. Uh, uh, there is also uh, the same instruction, you know, for example, on uh, ARM processors on, on mobile phones. So in theory, we can also expect to get uh, the improvements on this type of processors. Uh, and uh, I should put the warning here. Uh, right now, the binary neural networks uh, is uh, the accuracy of binary neural networks is not uh, does not match the accuracy of. Uh, uh, their floating point counterparts. Here's the difference. Uh, but uh, the good thing is uh, that it's uh, the active area of research and uh, uh, the accuracy is uh, improving uh, quite rapidly. This is uh, improvement in uh, just two years. And I also want to add that uh, in the near future, we should expect uh, the explosion of specialized uh, hardware for inferencing and training of, on, of neural networks. And uh, a lot of uh, silicon uh, companies are working right now on the specialized chips. And uh, this uh, quantized and compressed network, I think, they should be more relevant uh, on this specialized hardware because we just don't need uh, 32 bits to represent our uh, weights and activations in the networks. So that's the end, the end of my talk. Thank you. Uh, do you have any questions to Alexander? Do anyone or you or someone else consider some uh, exporting of training of trained neural network into a, a plain C function? Sorry, can you repeat the last part? Uh, ex I mean, uh, exporting a trained neural network into a plain C function that can be compiled with a compiler into a native code and then uh, some uh, load it as a dynamic module. Yes. Uh, and another related question. Uh, you have uh, mentioned uh, uh, some low-level CPU operations. How are they implemented? Uh, uh, is it uh, something like a just-in-time compilation or what else? So starting from the last question, uh, you just need to have uh, uh, this operation in the instruction set of the processor. So it, sh it should support it natively in hardware. Otherwise, you don't have any inference uh, speed improvements uh, because uh, uh, modern processors uh, support floating point operations in hardware and the, this is quite fast. So if it doesn't support your, your instructions in hardware, you typically lose to the floating point uh, numbers. And uh, asking the second question, uh, we tried uh, to write just plain C code and uh, hope that compiler will uh, understand how to translate it to the optimized instructions, but uh, it doesn't typically work and you should uh, 
write uh, the low level uh, intrinsic codes by your hands uh, to get the maximum performance? Uh, well, uh, such a feature was implemented uh, about uh, 20 years ago in the Stuttgart Neural Network Simulator. The, it was a, it, it, uh, it uh, has implemented a function that generated uh, a C code from his trained networks. Uh, can you suggest or are you aware of some uh, modern packages or software packages that can do the same thing? Because that project, project is dead now. Yeah, uh, for example, MXNet is an open source framework for training neural networks. They have a possibility uh, to convert your neural network to just play, plain C code and to uh, make it easy to port it to different devices without dependencies. So MXNet it's, it's a good uh, choice. More questions? Uh, I, uh, naturally, uh, most of uh, these uh, approaches uh, are focused uh, on uh, performance improvement uh, on uh, recogni uh, recognition uh, operation of network. But uh, if we are speaking about uh, improvements uh, uh, or speeding on, of training, uh, 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 how does the, the, la the last approach, uh, I mean, uh, XOR nets um, or quantized nets, uh, influence on uh, uh, training performance? Uh, right now, it doesn't get any improvement in training because in training you usually use floating point numbers and then just convert it, quantize it. And, but uh, as I mentioned, uh, we have uh, special types of hardware. Uh, especially in the future, there will be special types of hardware that will allow to use these quantized uh, techniques also in the training and get uh, inference uh, and get speed ups here also. Sorry. Inclusion uh, XOR nets as well. They are also trained as the uh, usual net, but then converted uh, to uh, bitwise operations. Uh, are there? Are, yeah, are they? I think any, any nets, uh, that, uh, any neural networks can benefit from it. Okay, so one last question. My question is very simple. Uh, have you tried to use uh, these approaches in your work? Yeah, we have tried uh, compression and it actually works. Uh, so it's easy to get 20 times uh, compression without any loss in accuracy. Uh, we have also tried to implement neural networks on uh, four mobile processors and uh, we, right now, we also, all, all, almost tried uh, floating point uh, multiplications, but uh, we also see that there is a possibility on uh, mobile phones uh, where we can use uh, int, voice, in, in, int 8 instructions or even bitwise neural networks, but uh, this one we haven't tried yet. Uh, okay, also, uh, we discussed some, in my opinion, technical approaches. But uh, have you used in your work um, mathematical approaches for pruning neural networks? Uh, we use extensively these uh, modifications to the neural network architectures that I described, uh, and uh, it uh, really works. So it's, uh, it's quite easy. You just design your network in a way that it's uh, more computationally efficient than standard one. And uh, yes, this one we use a lot. Thank you. Okay, let's thank uh, all the speakers of this session. And uh, so now uh, it's a break, and at the same time, so there is a UC around uh, some posters. So there are, we have around uh, 15 posters here, and also a demo session behind you. So demo session is uh, not huge, so please don't go everybody there at the same time, but uh, please check it out. It's, uh, it has some interesting demos inside. And we will be uh, waiting for you back at 3 o'clock.
друзья, теперь я поговорю на русском немного. У нас Russian Lviv right now our break will take one and a half hours and during these one and a half hours you will be able to see the poster sessions represented on the left side from me and also in our audience uh, next to me. The teams that have been working on these projects are going to tell you about them and while before we have started our second part uh, you can have lunch in Strelka bar and here on the terrace and uh, the remaining lectures will start at 3 p.m. Thank you very much.